Welcome back to episode number two of the Upside Down Health Podcast. I haven't shared this with you, Simon, why I'm calling it Upside Down. Basically, I've just realized that most of the health truths that I come across when I first discover them, they seem really bizarre. But the more I dig into them, the more true they become, and the more I realize that this is something that I want to do. So you are the second guest on my podcast, Simon Lewis. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And I like I like the title. Can definitely relate to, yeah, feeling like things are maybe upside down initially, but then your kind of perspective t- tilts and uh, and it all starts to make sense. So I think it's a great title. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it was a it was a super random idea that just like I think I woke up with it one morning a couple of weeks ago. So that's kind of how most ideas come to me. Um, yeah, so you're you're a very big advocate for the carnivore diet. That's how I came across you. You started this 30 day carnivore challenge. Uh, why don't you tell us about how you got involved with the carnivore diet and why you're such a big advocate? Sure. Um, I think I first discovered carnivore through Keegan Smith um, and then Sean Baker was on the Joe Rogan podcast talking about it uh, and that really helped to popularise this idea of only eating meat. Um, I, like most people, thought, hey, that's crazy, you need fruit and vegetables to be healthy um, when I first sort of started reading or, or listening to things about carnivore. Um, but something inside of me, like, it instinctively made sense. Um, And I think that's because I probably have a more sensitive gut than most people. Um, And I've always been quite aware of how I respond to food. Um, So when I'm sort of hearing this information that you can eat just meat and you'll have really low inflammation, you'll have no bloating in your stomach, you'll have really even consistent energy throughout the day. Um, And then it can also have you know, knock on effects like improved skin, improved teeth. Um, you can build muscle faster, cut fat. Um, all of that really appealed to me. Uh, and I thought, yeah, I want to, I want to give this a try. Um, so, you know, self, self-experimentation is good fun. Um, and that's something that, you know, I'm totally open to. So yeah, I started experimenting with just eating meat and organs and bone broth. Um, and I found the energy and the mental clarity was unbelievable um, and started to dip in and out of ketosis, which was a, a totally new experience. Um, and then over time, I suppose I've developed my own approach to what I would call nutrient dense eating, um, which is where you do get the majority of um, your energy and your nutrients from an animal based diet, but you can still enjoy the, um, things like whole fruit and vegetables uh, and you can still go out to dinner with friends and you can still be a normal person but you've got this uh, weapon in your uh, artillery which is you know metabolic flexibility uh, and being able to really focus on your health when you want to um, and achieve really great results when when that's a focus for you uh, so that's a bit about kind of how i got into it and, and my philosophy around eating at the moment which is always changing it's very interesting. I'm curious how you settled on this idea of nutrient dense eating. Is it to a disassociate from like becoming dogmatic? That's definitely part of it. Um, because you know, the word carnivore can be, you know, quite divisive or triggering. Um, you know, for, particularly for people who prefer a vegetarian or vegan diet. Um, and Nutrient dense, it, to me, it, it makes a lot of sense because when I just eat a steak, I get so much energy from just eating that steak. And it, you know, it might um, have less calories than, say, like a fast food meal, but there is there are so many nutrients, protein and fat uh, in that one steak that will keep me fueled for hours and hours. Um, and you know, one way to think about it is that not much comes out the other end. Um, so that's another thing that people experience when they play around with carnivore that, you know, really it's, you know, it's more like a rabbit versus a horse um, in terms of yeah, how much you're crapping. Um, so your body's using everything uh, and it's really 
bioavailable um, and it's right there for you to fuel to fuel yourself. Um, yeah, so for me, actually, uh, Dr. Pran Yaganathan is, some, is someone um, you should all follow on Instagram. Um, and he, he was the one that, for me, kind of coined the term nutrient dense. Um, mm. And yeah, I, I just think it makes a lot of sense to me. Well, it follows this like, like the thing I love about knees over toes guy and all these Keegan system and everything is that it's numerically based. So it's, it's about, you can actually measure this and like with nutrients, you can actually measure it. So you can get into the bioavailable argument and all this stuff. And that's something that people need to learn about. But if you can actually see, you could put it in an Excel document or whatever, you can see it on paper. These are the foods that have the nutrients that my body needs. Mm -hmm. So I really like that idea. And it's, you know, that's the easy way. Uh, like, you, I don't know, you would have seen um, graphs and memes showing like, you know, how much spinach you need to eat to get the same amount of iron as how much steak you need. Um, sure, you can make it happen on a vegetarian or vegan diet, but it's hard work. Like for me, this is, this is the easy path. Hmm. So, yeah, because I, I like how you disassociate with the carnivore because people will make the argument like, I think we're herbivores and I think that we're, we're vegetarians and all these things. So what do you say to like people who are arguing for the vegan based eating? Like you don't come across as someone who would say you're wrong, right? I would think you'd take a different approach, but how do you approach those, those kind of arguments? Yeah, I think that's, um, it's just not really my interest. Uh, I'm not trying to communicate to people who are super dogmatic and already fixed uh, in thinking one way. Um, you know, I'm more interested in talking to people who have a bit more of a flexible mind and, and actually want to learn about something that's really helped me. And is, you know, with Mackenzie's Meats, which is my meat business, you know, I've got hundreds of customers who are eating meat-based diets and they've had incredible health turnarounds based on, you know, this way of life. Um, so I'd, I'd much rather focus on talking to them and helping them um, rather than getting into some sort of argument. It's, it's just not my interest. Is your business mainly based on referrals? Like you get these people, you're basically getting them results by getting them quality food and now they're telling everybody? Yeah, more or less. Um, or they'll, uh, so probably half would come from um, people telling their friends and family that they're, they're loving the quality of the meat uh, and, the, and the service. And then the other half would come from um, quite a bit of organic traffic because I write like I write blog posts on my website. Uh, and when people are looking for a quality grass fed meat supplier in Sydney or Canberra, both in Australia, um, you know, the, some of them connect with the website, which is fantastic. So yeah, tell us a little bit more about your business, Mackenzie Meats. How did you set on the name, the website, all these kind of ideas, and what what problem are you trying to solve with that? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm I have solved my own problem, uh, which is when I started getting more into uh, animal based diet or a nutrient dense diet, um, I couldn't find affordable, really high quality grass fed meat. Uh, and I also can't stand going to the supermarket. So I wanted something that was delivered to my home in the right portions. I wanted it to be subscription. I wanted it to be um, in uh, basically like set meat boxes that I could choose that were sort of prescribed to me so that I knew how much meat I had to eat or, or could eat for that one week or two week period. I couldn't find anything that I was really happy with. Um, a lot of the home delivery options have a lot of packaging they have small portions they're expensive and it's not super flexible so that's why i started mckenzie's meats to solve that problem uh, and now you know people all over sydney and canberra can get this really high quality grass-fed beef and lamb as well as pork and chicken um, and i've also tacked on some amazing products like bone broths uh, all sort of crap free and nutrient dense so bone broths air dried steak um healthy sources uh liver capsules for people who don't want to eat um actual well the sort of fresh liver this is desiccated freeze-dried liver in capsules uh and continue to people like that yeah exactly yeah no, no, I, I, I mean organs. i'm like that now i have the liver capsules every day really? um, which is great. do you eat any organs uh 
Yeah, I'll eat, uh, I'll eat liver. We do kidney as well sometimes at home. Um, those are the two main ones. And then I'll have my... I think I'm losing you a little bit. Uh, Sorry, Max, have you got me now? Going in and out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're just, your voice was going a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you... Uh, okay. You're like a robot. A bit. What's that? Was my voice like a robot when it starts yeah. to sort of, the connection starts to break? Yeah. It could be my end too. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. So you're you're basically delivering high quality meats to people and you did it because you couldn't find it when you were trying to start the diet. So is your vision to take this like globally or are you trying to just become like the best in your country, your area? Yeah, I'm trying to become the best, the best in Australia. So there's, there's a company called Butcher Box in the States. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, Max. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's, I suppose, a similar model to Butcher Box, except Butcher Box delivers frozen meat, um, whereas ours is all fresh and nothing against frozen meat. Uh, it can be equally high quality. But in Australia, the market just prefers fresh meat. I think it's because there, there is such an abundance of farmland and animals around all the capital cities that, that people do expect fresh meat. Um, so yeah, the vision is to be yeah, the biggest in Australia. Yeah, so fresh, fresh versus frozen is one of those qualities that you're trying to be better at. And then, for those people like who are interested in carnivore and they're thinking about like grain-fed meat and grass-fed meat, what can you tell us about like why would I go with grass-fed? And is it okay to go with grain-fed if that's you know if that's all I can all I can afford? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, good question. Um, again, I don't think there's any right or wrong answer when it comes to grass-fed or grain-fed. Um, one thing to think about is grass-fed is more natural. So it, it more closely represents what our ancestors would have eaten. Um, a grass-fed and finished cow, for example, uh, has literally been on open pasture eating grass that it's picked itself from the ground its entire life. Uh, whereas grain-fed, uh, generally for the last let's say 100 days of its life, it'll be fed grain. Um, it won't be force fed grain, but it'll have that option. Uh, and because grain is so full of energy, but nutrient poor, it's a really fast way to put on weight. Um, so if you get a grain fed steak and you put it next to a grass fed steak, there is generally going to be more fat marbling through the grain fed steak um, because they would have had that period at the end of their life where they've really put on a lot of weight and most of that is fat. Um, and that means that the farmer can make more money from the cow basically because they're selling more meat than they would have if the, if the cow was just left on grass. Um, in terms of the, the well, it's, at the same time, it's, it's a delicacy to eat grain-fed meat because it has incredible marbling. And you would have seen um, photos of really marbled, Wagyu beef. Um, what do you mean by marbling? You know, marbling when you say that? Um, so, mar so when you have a steak, um, the kind of pink or red bits, that's the muscle. And then the white bit, uh, which might be in a rump along the side or in like a, say, a, a ribeye, it'll be marbled all the way through the pink of the, um, of the steak. So if it's really, you know, if it's a a grain fed wagyu and it's really well marbled you're gonna it's gonna be like half white half red it's got this like this fat running all the way through it which means when you eat it it'll, it'll melt like butter and you know it'll be delicious um so when you're looking at a steak that's generally how you can tell the difference between grass grain fed um grass fed meat is more nutritious so it's got more of the healthy fats running through it so the fats that it does have in it um, they are more, um, more healthy, basically. You've got more omega uh, and other nutrients in there. And it, it is representing what happens in nature more closely than, mm. than uh, a cow that's been fed grain. Um, so that's why 
grass is my preference and, and we distribute grass fed beef and lamb. Um, but you know, I don't have a problem with grain fed. Uh, it's just if you're being really strict with your health and you want to get absolutely the most out of everything, um, then go for the grass over the grain. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You just, it's not like grain fed is bad for you when you compare it to what other people are eating out of boxes and stuff from the store. But yeah, that makes sense that you would want to deliver the highest quality stuff. Something that you said that was kind of piquing my interest was you mentioned the whole ancestral eating kind of thing. And then you're also talking about fat. And to me, I see those things being pretty correlated because Keegan also talks about this, how we we were fat hunters, our ancestors were fat hunters. So do you buy into this philosophy of live like your ancestors? And why, why would absolutely. you if you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that flows through to most of the kind of um, health and philosophical you know, aspects of my life. Um, there's a lot of ancient wisdom that tends to get pushed aside these days uh, and it will continue to be pushed aside that um you know it's ancient wisdom for a reason it, it actually works uh and i don't know max if you've seen the tv show alone um i can't remember who streams it but it's um basically these contestants are alone in the alaskan wilderness um, and if they survive 100 days with limited tools like an axe and a bow and arrow um, then they get a million dollars and it's mm. seriously entertaining it's like watching live sport um, but it's survival. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, and every single one of those contestants is a fat hunter. That's the, that is their priority from day one. They know that they're not going to be able to get enough carbohydrates in the form of like, you know, root vegetables or seaweed or what else they did for, like the odd berry um, to be able to run on glucose, to be able to run on carbohydrates. They know that the best source of energy out there um, is fat uh, and they'll most likely be in ketosis pretty quickly because they're basically fasting and, and then the nutrition that they're getting is fat. So they'll, they'll catch certain animals, like say, for example, they'll catch a, um, like a weasel or um, even something as big as like a massive moose. Uh, and, and you're looking at this massive animal and you're thinking, that's incredible. Uh, that's food for the whole journey, um, they're going to win. You know, or I've got 10 weasels, or I've got 10 rabbits, um, she's, on, she's on fire, she's going to win. Mm. But the problem is you can only eat so much protein if you don't have fat. Uh, and, and those animals are really lean. Um, mm. And uh, there's a thing called rabbit starvation, um, which is where sailors who were um, you know, going from America to Australia uh, 150 years ago uh, would have a heap of rabbits on board. So they've got the protein they need, but they don't have any fat. And so they would, they would starve. Um, so these contestants on alone, take it back to alone, um, when they catch a really fatty fish uh, or when they catch a porcupine, these are, these are fatty animals and this gives them the energy they need to survive. Um, so if we kind of think that alone is in some ways mimicking how our ancestors may have survived in like a you know sort of frontier environment um you can see that there's a lot to learn from that you know for potentially for optimal health most of the time they're running on fat that's what's giving them sustainable energy uh and you know from my own experience i think that when you are running on fat for energy and you are metabolically flexible you're not fixed on having to rely on glucose spikes from carbohydrates for energy all the time i've found i have a lot more mental clarity uh, and i can th i can th think more clearly uh, and i can work for longer um, and you know our ancestors and people in history have done incredible things like you know crossing oceans to find new continents um, and surviving in really harsh environments and uh, I think in, that's in part because they were uh, running on fat in ketosis and, um, you know, that was how they functioned optimally. Hmm. Yeah, so ketosis, why don't we dive into that a little bit? And, like, I've heard you mention this term metabolic flexibility. 
to an average person, maybe ketosis seems a little kind of scary. Like I've been eating carbs my whole life. Why would I just, why would I stop eating them? Uh, how do you explain that to the average person? You kind of just did with the running on fat idea, but yeah, well, how does metabolic flexibility relate to ketosis as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so to me, metabolic flexibility means that uh, you have the option to run on glucose from carbohydrates or you can run on fat um, and you might source your fat from eating, um, you know, beef has a lot of fat in it, fish has a lot of fat in it, um, or you might literally eat animal fat to, um, to kick your body into the process of using that fat for your energy. Um, and yeah, I suppose in terms of, in terms of the, the benefits, um, from my experience, running on fat is like running on, you know, maybe say like diesel versus running on high octane petrol. Uh, which is often like running on, uh, which which I would liken to sugar or carbohydrates. So when you're running on diesel, you have this consistent energy where you can just keep uh, plugging away uh, and you're less likely to have those uh, mood swings, uh, which I'm sure most of us have experienced, uh, and afternoon crashes, afternoon slumps. It's just like, a, you know, um, it's a more practical source of energy in, in my opinion because, you can you can just keep on ticking. Um, so that's kind of yeah. That's uh, some of my thoughts around metabolic flexibility. Yeah. How, what else have you noticed with ketosis? What like what what keeps you coming back for it? Aside from just the clarity and and the because I've noticed it too. Like I just the energy is stable. Like even when you you're going to bed, like you're really not that tired till you're going to bed. So mm. most people haven't experienced that, but. Are there other things with ketosis and even with the carnivore diet that you see as like these massive benefits? I think uh, definitely for your um, for your body composition. Um, so if we're talking about, say, like how much fat you have on your body, uh, if you're metabolically flexible, you know you can cut out carbohydrates you can fast for a little bit and you can, you know, you can happily go 12, 16, 24 hours without having those intense hunger, pain, hunger pangs. Uh, and you can start to feed yourself a, a slightly more high fat diet, kicking yourself into ketosis. And then your body will actually use the fat that you're eating and the fat on your body for energy. So if losing fat is a real focus for you, which it is, which it is for a lot of people, uh, having metabolic flexibility, being able to flick a switch where you're now actually burning the fat that's on your body um, rather than, you know, the sort of stereotypical Australian or American who's going to the gym and doing endless cardio, thinking that this is somehow going to keep their body into um, burning the fat off. When you're in ketosis, you are literally burning fat for energy. So whether it's coming from you eating it or whether it's coming from your body, um, that is an effective way of shedding fat. And I know in, um, in Keegan's community, there's, you know, tens or hundreds of people who have, you know, really shed layers of fat off their body and revealed a much more athletic, happy, um, functional physique. Um, so I think, well, I know in terms of fat loss, if you, if you can, which isn't difficult, start to become metabolically flexible and enter ketosis when you want to, then yeah, you can burn body fat um, quickly. And the other thing is, um, strangely enough, doing, doing the carnival diet. Uh, so one of my friends recently did 30 days in carnival. Um, and he got a body scan before and after the 30 days. And when he came back after 30 days, he was actually heavier than he was when he first did than when he first did his scan. So I think he went from like 87 kilos to 88 kilos, um, but he'd also lost three kilos of fat. Um, but what, what he'd done is he'd put on three and a half or four kilos of muscle in 30 days. So you can actually build muscle, which Max, I'm pretty sure you've experienced this because you've got a, mm -hmm. a pretty significant before and after. Um, you can build muscle while you're losing fat. And 
in this in this state of eating a really nutrient dense diet of dipping in and out of ketosis uh, and eating a lot of protein uh, your muscles will get the fuel they need and if you're doing even a little bit uh, of exercise they will start to build and it's almost like they're building to the way that they're meant to be um, and you know it just it's, it's sort of like a, un, unlocking a, a state where your body can run the way it's meant to and you're not holding it back by constantly fueling it with carbohydrates. You're, you're giving it um, the best the best chance to you know, express itself. Um, so bottom line, yeah, from a body composition perspective, uh, nutrient-dense diet, getting into ketosis and metabolic flexibility, yeah, you can shed fat and you can build muscle. And it can happen quickly like it has for you, Max. Yeah, it definitely... I think I put on, I, I think most of what I put on has been muscle, but definitely I gained so much so fast that I think I definitely added some fat too. Yeah. Um, I'm sure a couple intense fasts or something like that'll be, I'll be able to use that to lean out a little bit. Um, curious, you're talking a little bit about like metabolic flexibility and how this, the average American or person who's trying to lose weight goes to the gym and they're just running off. They're running it off. They're like, I just need to burn it, burn it, burn it. But I've also come across this idea that if you eat better foods, your metabolism actually speeds up. So you may be burning 2,000 today, and if you cut calories to 500 calories a day, now your metabolism is going to slow down, and that's why Weight Watchers doesn't work. So what can you tell us about how this diet, how this way of eating actually can improve our metabolism sure well i'm not a scientist um so i'll, I'll lean on <laughs> yeah, it's a tough know, one. Stuff, yeah stuff i've read from other people in my own experience um I, I mean a couple of things on that when you have more muscle your body naturally burns more calories every day um so building muscle is actually a good way to, a good way to lose fat because you can keep eating the same amount um but your body's using more energy and therefore you're burning fat um, the second thing that I'd say on that is one of the reasons I don't think, say, Weight Watchers works uh, is because you're hungry. And when humans are hungry, you go and eat. Uh, you know, I can, uh, I can only starve myself for so long before I just go to the fridge and I, and I go and gorge. Um, but the difference with eating a really nutrient-dense diet is you're not hungry. So you might only be eating twice a day. But that's not because you're forcing yourself to eat only twice a day. It's because it's what you feel like. You've had steak and eggs. You know? You've know, you had some slow-cooked meat uh, or a roast or burgers or whatever, um, burger patties or whatever. But uh, your body has the fuel it needs. You've got all the nutrients you need. You're running on fat. You're not hungry. Uh, and because you're not hungry, you're not then going and gorging on you know, pizza, pasta, Maccas, whatever you can get your hands on. Yeah, you guys call it Maccas out there, right? McDonald's? <laughs> yeah, McDonald's, yeah. <laughs> My sister has a Australian friend that has lived with us for a couple of years, so I've gotten used to some of the slang. <laughs> it's funny. There's a lot <laughs> of different ones. Um, yeah, so, dang, that's there's a, lo there's a lot to unpack here, but... I'm curious, like, say there's that person who's, who's, they're looking to lose fat. Obviously, this way of eating is, it seems like it could be the answer for a lot of people. And you don't even have to do, do as much as you think. Like, you just said, two meals a day. It's, and, and you're, sati you're satiated. Like, these meals fill you up. So, but still, someone might be like, I don't know. Like, this seems really crazy. This is upside down my my friends are going to think I'm crazy. Like, I don't think I can do this. What are some like small things people can do? Whether it's like, maybe it's a certain drink that you drink in the morning or certain things that they can implement in their diet in the, in the, in the short run. And maybe they could work up to this kind of way of eating. Yeah, sure thing. I think you make a really good point, Max. Um, it's, it's basic. It's not rocket science. Stop eating food from packets and boxes. Um, so just start eating whole foods. So when you sit down for a meal, have you know a portion of protein, steak, chicken, 
eggs, some sort of meat, and then have whole vegetables. If you're really craving something sweet, can I have a piece of fruit? Um, and then, and then you'll start to notice if, I mean, if you are somebody who eats uh, a, a lot of junk food, a lot of processed food, once you start cutting out that processed food, um, like say cereals or, um, you know, bread, uh, pastas, anything that's got refined carbohydrates, high in sugar, um, any preservatives, cut that out and replace it with protein um, and start to see how you feel. And then once you make that kind of small change, um, I think you'll start, if you are interested, you'll start naturally adding more layers. Um, like, for example, in Australia, and I believe it's the same in America, there's vegetable and seed oils um, in so many packeted products. Uh, and again, I'm not a scientist, but these are like industrial oils that are not fit for humans to eat and they cause a lot of inflammation. And when you start to cut out things like the seed oils, things like refined carbohydrates and replace it with healthy protein and fat from whole food sources, uh, like you know, eating a steak, just eating a burger patty, eating some chicken breast, whatever it is, uh, I do think you'll naturally feel like you have more energy. You won't have to eat as often. Um, and uh, yeah, your, your body composition will change for the better. So once you kind of make those, those really small changes, which most people talk about, um, I think then there can be like a knock-on effect and you can start to get this ball rolling. And um, yeah, once you see things are working for you, you'll, you'll most likely want more. That makes a lot of sense. Just, yeah, just, it's almost like taking one small step and you're, you're likely, I don't know, there is something about this where like, sometimes you get worse before you get better. If you go all out on the carnivore diet, Yeah, that's kind totally. of an idea there. So people have to be careful there and maybe commit a little bit if they are going to go for the full commit. Um, you mentioned fruits and vegetables. So there is this argument against vegetables versus fruits, like that fruits may be more so the carbohydrate that we should utilize. What do you think about that? Yeah, I'm not too sure. When I when I crave a bit of fruit or or some veggies, then I'll just I'll just go and have them. Um, but I do. But I am starting to notice, you know, which fruit and vegetables um, sort of make me feel a little bit inflamed or, or make me feel bloated. Um, or make me feel better than others. Um, like for example, in the in the world of fruit, like I really love eating oranges, and um, I'm you know I'm not going to stop doing that. And I find that you know I feel good after I have oranges. But I also like apples, and if I have apples, they've got a lot of fiber in them, and because I don't eat that much fiber, I can feel bloated in my gut, and I can feel like I'm being a bit slowed down. Um, so you know I, I would say experiment. And that, I mean, that is one of the beautiful things about the carnivore diet is that it's a total elimination diet. And then you can start to add in other things like certain fruits and vegetables and see how your body responds. You know, avocado, lots of healthy fat in there. I really enjoy eating avocado. You know, it, it works for me. Same with, same with mushrooms. Like I love eating mushrooms. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the... Like I, don't eat, I don't eat any uh, raw vegetables. Um, Tom Boichi, who's a friend of mine, uh, and he's helped me with this carnivore challenge that we're running, um, he kind of explained uh, that yeah, raw vegetables can be really tough in your gut because your body's working so hard to get the nutrients out of them. Um, so, you know, for me, that's one thing that I would, that I would avoid. But, you know, cooked sweet potato uh, with some olive oil and some salt, like it's delicious. Um, so there's some of my thoughts on, on yeah, fruit and veggies. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense too. It's like, you gotta kind of, you gotta test it out. Test the waters, what feels good. Like this is your body, your life, figure out what works for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it just, it's, it's logical. So there's Ben Patrick actually talks about uh, the equator diet. So, this is basically the idea that like when it comes to fruits, you should be eating what your ancestors would have been eating or around where, where you are related to the equator and stuff. Do you know anything about that? And what can you, what can you share? 
to me, I've, I've read um, Ben Patrick's blog on that. And yeah, to me, it instinctively makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, like if I put it into the, obviously it's not a hard and fast rule, but I think it's a really good guide. I think it's a clever framework to use. Um, so to put it into perspective of say myself, um, my ancestry uh, would be like predominantly Scottish, I would say. Um, and if you have a look at Scotland, like there's not bananas and mangoes growing everywhere. Um, but there are sheep and cows um, and there are, you know, potatoes and sweet potato, oh, maybe not sweet potato, potatoes and root vegetables. So mm -hmm. those sorts of foods, um, yeah, I, I run well on, on that sort of stuff and it is predominantly um, animal-based traditionally in Scotland. You know, I think about the middle of winter, that's what they would have been eating. Um, and, my, you know, my, my body does suit that style of eating. Whereas I have a, a Mexican friend um, who eats a lot of, you know, fruit, vegetables, legumes. Um, you know, he's he's probably like 70, 70, 80 percent vegetarian, um, and he's a really fit soccer soccer player. Um, and he runs well on that stuff. And I don't know if I've sort of potentially cherry picked two examples of me versus him, um, but yeah, it instinctively makes sense. And I, I think it's a helpful way to think about nutrition, totally. It's interesting that you bring that up with your friend. So there's this guy that maybe he's eating more vegetarian and I'm not saying that's wrong or whatnot, but he seems to be doing really well. Like there are some top level yeah. athletes that are eating this way. So people may look at that and say, look, like I'm just going to follow them. Now we also see these, th these cases where like, you know, someone was fit their whole life. They, they, they ran every day, they ate clean and then they dropped dead at 45 from a stroke or they have some other severe health crisis at 45, 50. Now, I think I've been programmed to think, damn, that really sucks. Like, you just got a bad apple and, like, you know, your genetics hit you. But the more I study this stuff, it kind of makes sense that, well, maybe you could look good, but internally you're actually, your body's in, like, a health crisis state. And when things like this happen, it's, it's actually the result of what you've been eating or not necessarily just food, but what environment you've been in. So yeah, that's a lot there, but what do you think about that idea that there could be health problems even though you look good on the outside? Mm, yeah, I think it's a really interesting topic. Um, I mean, I suppose one of the things that, that I would encourage people to do is to become more in tune with how your body feels and how your body is responding to the food you're eating because um, I know from my experience and from speaking with other people, often they really don't know um, how they feel after eating certain foods. Uh, and like, you know, uh, every night I'm, you know, I'm bloated and exhausted and passed out on the couch. It's like, you know, people do that for their entire lives, um, but they haven't ever really had the kind of self-awareness to say, well, why is this happening? And why did this happen worse tonight than it did yesterday? Um, when I ate two different meals. I, I think becoming more in tune with how your body responds and how it feels. Uh, and then, you know, if health is your priority, then, then do put in the effort to work out how your body's responding and work out what, you know, what you run best on. And, um, and, and that's, you know, I can, uh, with Mackenzie's Meats and with How To Carnivore, like, you know, I can, uh, share information from people who've had success, but it, it comes down to the individual to to piece that together and create their own framework and test and, you know, do what's best for them. Hmm. I like that approach. Do you eat cheat meals? Do, do you take cheat meals? Uh, I, I, don't, I definitely don't think about it as, as cheat meals. Um, I don't know. Like if I think about the foods that I like eating, um, yeah, I suppose like if I go and have like a few a few glasses of wine and like you know in a way like I really enjoy that and you know is is that a cheat meal I'm not I'm not sure but yeah often if I'm going to gorge myself it'll be you know, 
I've eaten way too much sweet potato and way too much steak. And I know it was the wrong thing to do, but yeah. but I've enjoyed myself. So yeah, no, I'm not I'm not very strict with myself, but then at the same time, I don't crave like donuts and McDonald's. It's just not not really my thing. Huh. If you were to go back to like say you had a slice of pizza, I've noticed this with myself. Like if I have sugar, my I get a migraine. Like my body's just mm. like, don't do that again. So yeah. and have you noticed that with yourself? Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good point. Yeah, I have noticed that with myself that um, particularly initially when I first started getting into eating a more nutrient dense diet, um, yes, I was like really sensitive to things. Um, like you know, if I had one beer, then I would feel you know swollen in in, in my in my guts. Um, Oh yeah, certain sugary foods. I just be like, oh, I feel horrendous, like energy spike, and then just a total a total crash. Um, but actually, as time has, has gone on, I've I'm I'm starting to become less sensitive um, to then going and experimenting with something that's um you know a bit more out there. And I wonder, I'm not an expert, but I wonder if that's because uh, my gut is much more healthy now, uh, so it can actually deal with um a little bit of randomness so yeah that's that's kind of my thoughts on it i'd be interested to hear someone who knows a lot more than i do talk about that yeah. kind of you know that like adaptation what do you think about probiotics um i don't take them i don't i don't have much to uh much to say there i in terms of gut health i i have a lot of bone broth um and we have like sources here that are that have got bone broth concentrate in them. Uh, and for me, um, that really calms my gut down and it feels like it's healing it. Um, so yeah, probiotics, I'm not too sure, but in terms of gut health, yeah, I'm big on the, on the bone broth. I like that answer. How do you cook it? Like I, I just use a slow cooker and I buy bones at, from a local place and cook it 18, 20 hours. But I'm curious, is that what you do? Yeah, that's that's what I do too. Um, and I might put like an onion or some celery, um, salt and pepper, that sort of thing, just that sort of thing in, or just to give it a little bit of flavour. Um, but also, we have some amazing ready-to-drink bone broth products in Australia, which I think you guys have in America as well. We um, do. I've just heard they're not as nutrient dense. Okay. Um, but maybe not. Yeah, I suppose it's probably. I mean. We'll, I stock one, um, which is called Good Bones, and that's definitely as nutrient dense because it's um, it's literally bone broth. And like I've been to their factory, they make it the same way that I make it. And when it comes out of the packet, like it's you know it's jiggly, uh, like jelly. Yeah. So I know that I know that one is um, very legit. But yeah, some of the the concentrates, I'm not sure whether. I mean, I have it every morning, um, and I feel great. Whether maybe you need to have a little bit more. Than you would if you were making your own um but in terms of convenience yeah that's that's the way i'm leaning at the moment what do you do for like meal planning and stuff do you just do you just cook everything the day of or do you do you have a system for that yeah i, I, I cook everything the day of um cool. i'm very well i'm lucky because i always have really high quality meat on hand um and also like i don't know i i quite like simple meals um maybe that's maybe that's a bit of a blessing in itself like i'm happy to throw a steak in the pan um and cook some eggs and i'm content and that doesn't require any meal prep it takes me like probably five minutes to cook and then i'm eating yeah. my uh, my first meal for the day so <laughs> yeah that's the way i like to do it and then for dinner maybe i'll put in a bit more effort do some sweet potato mash and um you know whether i'm making a slow cooked meat or like a roast or something like that um, but yeah I'm, i just i just go with the flow funny. it's it's funny because it's so easy like yeah get a, get a cast iron skillet just throw some beef, beef on there and... i know right with some butter and then you're, you're literally done yeah <laughs> do you use butter or tallow or different what kind of fats do you use yeah i use butter or ghee and ghee is like more concentrated butter with the with the dairy removed um, mm -hmm. it's really, really tasty and really healthy to cook in. Um, it has, it can withstand temperatures. Um, so that's, that's what I use, but yeah. What, what have you been using, Max? Tallow. 
and okay. uh, suet actually. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I cook it in the tallow, like my beef and stuff, and then I'll just heat up the suet on the side of the, the steak or the burger or whatever I'm heating up. Nice. Well, and, then, and then like and then the suet is like a, almost like a sauce because it's a, a bit melty. Yeah, you have to be careful. I, I used to cook it in the oven and I'd let it sit at like 150 for like two hours and it, it would get really oh. like juicy and it um, it wouldn't melt. But okay. like it takes a lot of planning and I'm just like, I'll just throw it on there. I just keep a big yeah. bag in the fridge and then it's really easy. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. I was, I was just thinking of one other question I have for you, um, but it's, it's slipped away from me. Um, Oh, you had it. I had it. Yeah, you right. It. You, you got it. Oh man, what was it? There's a, there's a question here that you sent me, which was about perception. Oh, yeah. So Is that the one. That was a that was what I was gonna get to, but ah, okay, something that just popped up when you were talking. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the last one is. I this podcast that I'm trying to create, I really want to bring nutrition and mental health together because I think they're correlated. Totally. You, I mean, actually, before we even get into that one, like, what do you think about just that concept alone? How does <laughs> the mental health crisis relate to what we're eating? Oh man, I think we're so aligned on that one, Max. Um, not really. Uh, I'm not totally sure how to frame it um, because you know I haven't had major me- mental health uh, challenges in my life. I've only, you know, only ever had small ones, so you know, I can't pretend to know what other people are going through. Uh, but I will say from my own experience, in terms of mood, happiness, concentration, finding purpose, um, energy levels, you know, I just overall satisfaction with life, when I've really concentrated on having a nutrient-dense diet, everything has worked better for me, um, including relationships, including health, including you know, all that satisfaction with life. Um, so, yeah, I, I personally feel very strongly that there's a, a very close correlation. Um, I mean, I can just go and self-experiment on myself. I'm just going to eat crap for a week uh, and hang out in my bedroom and not do anything. I guarantee you I will be feeling, I'll have a lot of head noise. You know, I won't be feeling good between my ears. Um, hmm. So, I mean, yeah, that, that, they're my thoughts. I know mental health is incredibly common complicated topic you meditate? Uh, uh, I, I journal cool. do, you, do you journal max i'm I, i've gotten into it before i've faded out of it but i think i'm coming back to it because it it makes a lot of sense yeah yeah for me for me journaling is huge and it really helps my mental health and it really helps my product productivity and those two things you know it's, it's all intertwined right like if you feel like you're getting things done you've got something to look forward to you're going to be a happier person um so for me i journal um every morning sometimes at night time but every day in the morning uh and i have it i have a structured journal which is called the stoic journal uh and it asks for um things that i'm grateful for in the morning um it asks for affirmations which is where um, you say positive things about yourself, like, you know, I am, I am helping other people. Um, I am, you know, I am making progress on my project, that sort of thing. Uh, and then also ask for uh, like what your big task for the day is, because generally there's one thing um, that you really need to concentrate on doing well for that day. Uh, so yeah, for me, journaling is huge. Um, and in, I suppose that in a way that is kind of like my meditation yeah i mean it's taking your thoughts and making them clear like i just heard a guy say if you write your goals down they're 80 percent more likely to become true like it just it, it's taking the th- thinking and just kind of making it clear and that's what meditation does in a way i think meditation kind of lets you like see your thoughts and see them appear but like writing it's the same kind of idea there uh, yes. Yeah, so the the last question we could wrap it up with is, it basically stems from this idea that perception is perception is king. Like to me, with mental health, how you perceive things, the different frameworks that you have for life, 
can make a massive impact on you. So what kind of frameworks just for living, not necessarily health, but in general, have you found helpful for, you know, achieving success in business and achieving success in all areas of life? Sure. Um, I mean, obviously something that I'm still working on. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think when, when you realize and you accept in your mind that perception is everything um, and that, you know, something can be good or something can be, something can be good to you or something can be bad to you based on how you choose to perceive it. Once you can practice that uh, and think about it in you know, as many situations as possible, it's like a muscle that you can train. Um, and it's it's self reaffirming, so it, it becomes truer every time you practice it. Um, and every time you you know you face with a new situation and you do manage to turn that into a positive or an opportunity for yourself. Um, so I think that's absolutely crucial, like accepting that and then practicing it. Um, and then sort of linked to that thought, um, a framework that really helps me is to remember that if you want to make the world healthier, don't focus on the sick. Don't focus on the people who are unhealthy and constantly fill your mind with, oh, this is so difficult. People are bringing us down. Processed food are killing us. Big pharma, blah, blah, blah. Focus on those who are healthy and focus on what they're doing to get the most out of life uh, and move towards um, that world of, of health. Um, and I think the same thing goes for business as well. Like, you know, do not focus on the customer that complained. Focus on the 99 customers who are absolutely loving your product. Mm. Do not focus on, you know, the one delivery that went wrong. Um, focus on how well all the other drivers did the delivery today. Like, you know, and how much incredible progress you've made over the last year, not this one week where you felt like you went backwards. <laughs> Focus on what is good, helpful, useful, making the world a better place. Uh, and again, it will be self-fulfilling, like this rolling ball where things just start to compound and get better and better, um, which I think is really linked to the idea that perception is everything. Um, so that would be my, and sort of where I'm at with those two topics, but still evolving and trying to, trying to work it out myself. That's, that's some golden little wisdom there. I mean, if you could just apply that and even with athleticism, if you're in a, if you're in a rut and you start digging into the world, the world of what's wrong with me, how do I fix this? See, like Keegan, I think it was Keegan, maybe Ben, they, they say like, don't be like a fixer, like be a solution finder, like go, like find the solution. Stop saying I have to fix myself. People don't realize that they're using these words and the words are, they're so powerful, man. Yeah. I, I really love that, but I've never heard it put in the way you just said it. And I think that's a, an amazing spot to end. So yeah, thank you so much. I, I didn't really know what to expect with this podcast, but I think we, we got a lot out of it. So thanks for, thanks for coming. Oh, thank you, Max, mate. You did really well. Your questions were fantastic. And yeah, we, we got into some good topics really really good topics big topics I, I hope people can take some value from you and then the last thing would be you know where can they find you what are you up to with this you know maybe you could talk about the 30 day challenge a little bit if people are interested yeah how, how can they reach out to you sure thing uh so uh we started a program called the 30 day carnival challenge which max is on board uh and what it is is it's a support network to help you achieve 30 days on the carnivore diet, however you deem to um, complete the diet. So whether you still want to eat, um, if you just want, if you still want to eat some whole foods, like say like sweet potato and honey, that's okay. Or if you want to do really strict carnivore with fasting, that's okay too. And this support network includes a curated information hub. Um, so you can you can get jump online uh, and find the best um, carnivore nutrition and lifestyle content all in one place. You don't have to sift through YouTube and the internet trying to work out what's real and what's completely made up. The other thing you get is you get access to a Telegram um, chat messenger. So you're in a message group with, um, you know, say 30 other people uh, who are all on the exact same journey as you. 
uh, and you're all supporting each other. Also in the group uh, are primal health coaches, professional athletes, uh, people who have had real success in the carnival diet and they can answer any question you have. And that sense of environment and community, you know, you are the sum of the four people or five people you surround yourself with. When you're in this environment, in the chat messenger, um, it really makes everything easier. It holds you accountable and it means you will achieve your goals, um, whether it be mental clarity, um, fat loss, muscle gain, endless energy. And the other thing that we're doing um, is that you will get uh, live presentations um, from, yeah, from professional athletes to doctors to um, fitness experts to hunters. Um, and after their presentation, you'll be able to ask them Q&As. So it'll be like Max and I are talking right now, but then we throw to a question and answer so that you get to chat to these people and um, ask them your most burning question. So it's all about, you know, it's all about achieving your goals. Um, but as you achieve them, you will achieve metabolic flexibility. You will enter ketosis. You will get a mountain of support um, and you're going to get these skills for life. Um, so that is very much the idea. And yeah, it's been, been a great success so far. And the next intake will be on the 15th of November. Um, so in about 15 days. And how much does this cost? So it's 100 USD uh, and you can find us at howtocarnival.com um, or howtocarnival on Instagram. Awesome. Well, I think, I think you shared everything that people would need to find you. So thanks again. And yeah, maybe we'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, up to. Awesome, man. Have a good one. Thanks, Max.